Hi, and thank you for joining me for our new Saturday night book, which is Kitty Kelly, The Royals, and it's quite a hefty one, isn't it? And I'm excited to get started with this with you. I'm going to start off with the author's note. I'm not going to go straight into chapter one because the author's note is fascinating because it tells you how she contacted the actual palace and the misconceptions about the book before it was even started to be written and also the enormous sort of entry she got into the private lives of the royal family through people that really they should have been able to trust. So we kick off with the author's note and it's dated February 13, 1997. Now, uh, she says, so I wrote to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as a matter of courtesy and said I was researching a book on the House of Windsor. Now, this initial contact was with the Queen's press secretary, as you would expect, and that was Charles Anson. And he wrote back to Kitty Kelly and it was more or less, you know, a little bit of sort of pontification. And he, he said, look, we do help authors, but we help authors that are writing sort of bona fide books about the royal family. We help them with historical detail, you know, factual context, you know, access to archives when granted, things like that. So it's a rather run of the mill letter that sort of is uh, just writing back to an author's first point of contact. Now, one of the ways, you know, the palace, of course, wants to protect themselves is they want to figure out, well, just what sort of author are you and just what sort of book are you going to write? So Charles Anson actually requests that Kitty Kelly submits an outline and he assures her that, of course, that this will be kept, you know, completely private. And that amuses her because she thinks, well, kept completely private from whom? The Queen? Uh the household staff, um, other courtiers, like who is it kept private from? But nevertheless, she persists. And this is what's fascinating about her is she has the ability to get people to trust her and continue to have conversations with her. And I really think that that is her magic and how she has been able to write all these unauthorized biographies because she manages to get people on side and she manages to get all the facts that matter. Now, she points out that she doesn't disclose her sources because particularly in this case, if any royal informant was discovered, if it was a member of staff, of course they risked getting sacked and, you know, they risk losing their pension or something like that. And if it was a member of the aristocracy giving her the heads up, which did happen, well, then they risk being shunned. They mightn't get their invite to Ascot that year or they might, um, you know, be invited to a, a, a banquet or a state dinner or something like that or a church service or something. So everyone had to be very cautious and everyone had to be very careful. But what's astounding to me is the great risk that was, you know, that they were taking on, yet they still did it. So she must have been a very, very persuasive person. Now, I've marked a little bit here that two amusing things that I think is a hoot. Now, it got into the Daily Star that Kitty Kelly was going to be writing an expose book about Prince Philip, which, of course, she wasn't. She was writing this book, but that's what got out. And the Daily Star reported the exchange as Prince's threat over Kitty shocker. So all this sort of furor erupted, but it, she wasn't writing a book on Prince Philip. I mean, he does play quite a large part in this book, <laughs> But it wasn't a book just on him. But these stories that appeared in these sort of tabloid papers prompted numerous calls to my office in Washington, D.C. from men and women claiming to be the illegitimate offspring of royalty from Argentina, Australia, England, Wales and New York. People called to tell me of their royal parentage. So isn't that funny? And I believe that pretty much happens Today, I mean, with the advent of all the headlines that Meghan and Harry caused over the last three or four years, that has also been, there's been a lot more claims. Um, there's one in Australia that claims to be the love child of Camilla and Charles when they had their affair pre her marriage, when they were really young. Um, and he's, you know, determined to prove that he is their 
love child. Um, he sort of never seems to get anywhere with it, though, and he seems to have gone quiet of late. Now, I've just marked a little, little bit here. When I wrote back to the Queen's Press Secretary, I told him that I wanted to interview as many people as possible who could speak with authority on the House of Windsor. Now, whereupon with Charles Anson, all these letters are going back and forth, back and forth. And she actually says that. We exchanged more letters as I travelled back and forth between Washington, D.C. and London to do research. Now, in 1995, she actually was in England for the commemoration of VE Day on May the 8th. So for those that don't know, the day in 1945 when the Allies announced the surrender of German forces in Europe. So she contacted the palace while she was there for that. And she actually spoke to Mr. Anson on the phone. And they were discussing the stirring ceremonies and they were discussing the great, you know, turnout, over 50,000 people turning up to cheer the royals on the balcony. And uh, Mr. Anson was saying how moments like that of national significance make everyone realise just how important the royal family is to them. And um, so, you know, they were talking about how moving it was. And Kitty Kelly pointed out that this time the Queen Mother was flanked by her two daughters. But at the time of the actual VE Day, she had King George VI on one side and her Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, on the other side. These sorts of occasions, the Queen's press secretary told me, are very unifying for the country. They show that the monarchy is an arrangement that suits the British people. <laughs> and by extension, I guess, the Commonwealth. Then he suddenly became quite concerned over the next month or so about the fact that his talking to her and being polite um, was could be misinterpreted that somehow her book could be deemed as authorised by the palace. So he started to backtrack. I would say he started to cover his ass if you were being <laughs> really uncouth. But I think he got the heebies and probably because he knew that Prince Philip was a bit antsy about it all. Um, he didn't want to be seen as someone that had helped too much if you get my drift. So he sent her a last letter and the last letter from Charles Anson was, I should emphasize at this point, he wrote, that if the limited help we have given is misrepresented in any way in future, we will consider taking appropriate action. So, you know, veiled threats are descending. Now, this is extraordinary, and I've underlined it because I just think it is extraordinary. I have been able to interview several hundred people over the last three years, many of whom are current or former members of the royal household. I never pay for information, so they weren't doing it for the money, which is Interesting. I mean, you would think that if she offered to pay staff that a few would take it up because they weren't paid very well and, you know, they're probably thinking about their future and their retirement. But I always guarantee confidentiality to those who feared retaliation from the palace. If identified, those in royal service could lose their jobs and the retired could lose their pensions, as I pointed out before. Now, this blew my mind. Tell me down below if this blows your mind. It just astounded me, the level of disloyalty. Listen to this. I, I wouldn't want this to happen to me. Princess Margaret was travelling abroad and a member of her staff, whom I already knew, offered me a personal tour of her living quarters. I accepted gratefully. I'm sure she did because it was inside Kensington Palace. So she turns up at the gates and she's waved through by security because she's met by this person who she knows. Now, I have an inkling who this person was, but I don't want to say because I might be wrong. Member of staff, um, a member of staff that maybe you could say controls a lot of the other staff. When we walked into the residence of HRH, the Princess Mar Margaret, I gawked in disbelief because I was standing in the home of the sister of the wealthiest woman in the world. And prior to that, this 
disloyal person, had taken her on a tour of staff quarters. So she got to see the Grace and Favor apartments in Kensington Palace, in and around Kensington Palace. And she was amazed because a lot of them were sort of monk-like structures where it was just a room and there was a shared bathroom down the hall and there was basically just a cot bed, one window, one table, one chair. So it really seems a bit Downton Abbey, seems a bit um, upstairs, downstairs era type accommodation. But it was pointed out that, oh, but yes, but it was completely rent free. Those sort of monk-like cells, they didn't charge them rent in any way. So they really were grace and favour rooms to stop elderly staff from becoming homeless or you know so she saw everything she she literally saw everything so she goes on to describe uh the inners of uh princess margaret's apartment and oh gosh plastic flowers arranged in vases on the windowsills and an electric heater with a badly frayed cord oh, well megan would have something to say about that electric heater with a badly frayed cord, a collapsible aluminium tray was stashed behind the door of the drawing room. So obviously she would eat her dinner watching TV on a tray, which I know the Queen loved to do. And two large Blackamoor statues guide, guarding the entrance to the vivid blue room. Well, I assume they were removed before Meghan Markle visited uh, William and Catherine at their Kensington Palace apartment. And it's interesting that the guide showed her through all the rooms of the palace and answered any question she asked about the Queen, the Queen Mother, the Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Margaret, Princess Anne, Princess Andrew and Edward and the Prince and Princess of Wales. He was very forthcoming. But when she asked about Sarah Ferguson, which is interesting because I'm reading Sarah my story in another series, I was told curtly, she is not royalty. I gazed at the portraits and photographs and she saw uh, photos of Princess Margaret with uh, her firm, former husband, Anthony Armstrong Jones, and at a White House dinner and they were with President and Mrs Lyndon Johnston. And, oh, look, she just, she runs around. She ends up interviewing footmen and courtiers and members of the House of Lords and House of Commons. She even interviewed actress Glenda Jackson. <laughs> so you would have thought that she got quite an anti monarchist viewpoint from that interview. Lord Jacob Rothschild was more mis mischievous. Over dinner at the River Club in London, he mentioned he dined recently at Buckingham Palace. You're never supposed to say if you dine at the palace. But what's the fun of knowing the royals, he said with a wink, if you can't talk about them. So is there anyone that they can trust, one might ask. And so Kitty Kelly then goes on for the rest of the author's note. There is page after page after page of actual names. Now, these are the people that didn't want anonymity. And there's literally three or four pages specifying the help that she got and finishing up the author's note with deepest appreciation to her husband, Jonathan E. Zucker, to whom this book is dedicated. So I can't wait to share my insights from chapter one. For those of you that are joining me for the first time, I do not read out the book to you as that is a gross breach of copyright. I read it. I give my opinion, my review of the chapter and certain pertinent quotes I will quote. So I will read you a snippet that is relevant to something I'm telling you about, but I don't just sit and read the book. Okay, now quite a few of you have actually gone ahead and purchased this book, so by all means follow along with me. I'd be really interested to see in the comments down below, a bit like a book club, um, if you get a different, different interpretation of a chapter or something that I've reviewed, I want to hear your thoughts and I want to hear what you think um, because it's all about discussion and it's all about sharing the juice. <laughs> and I'll be back next Saturday. Kitty Kelly is going to be every single Saturday Day as a premiere at 9.45 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time so we can have fun with a bit of live chat and we can really get into this juicy book. Can't wait. See you again then with chapter one. Bye.